Gabriela Tercier, as many of you I'm sure know her, is a news anchor, she's a journalist for Univision Los Angeles. She is really well known for her reports on environmental, educational, social issues. In 2016, she was awarded the Otley Award by the government of Mexico for her contributions to promoting a positive perce perception of Mexicans in the U.S. She's also been recognized by the California Senate for her dedication to the betterment of Latino communities. She's received the Best News Anchor Award by the organization LA Press Club, and she's a recipient of seven Emmy Awards as a presenter, producer, reporter. She was born and, and raised in Mexico City, and I have the tremendous pleasure of seeing her today joining us at the conference. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Buenas tardes. ¿Cómo están todos? Okay, we're almost at the final stretch. I prepared a little presentation for you guys because there is a very good reason why you and your business have to have Latinos in mind all the time. There is a clear reason, and that is money, that is revenue, that is impact. And you guys have to know that we are bicultural, bilingual, multicultural, and we're here to stay. So that is the premise. Let's start from there. Um, this, this is important not only if you do business with Latinos. This is important for the growth. We have all the power, and we're going to see why right now. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. Which one was it? The one down? Yes. Yay. Okay, here we go. So thank you for that, Johanna. Yes, I was born and raised in Mexico City. My parents sent me and my five siblings to the German school. Not because they spoke German, not because they were Germans, but because it was the best school in town. Of course, they had to pay a high price for that. But that is what we Latinos do, right? We try to send our school, our kids to the best school available. So that's how it happened. I learned English there. I learned German there. Neither do I speak any of the, none of those languages. I forgot everything. But <laughs> so then I went to uh, the university in Mexico City, and as I was graduating, I landed an opportunity to come to the United States and work for one of the two most important Spanish language TV networks in this country. And I was pondering about it. My dad was a very well-known journalist in Mexico. And I said, why do I leave my beautiful country? He said, this is your ticket out. I am not going to go deep into that because most of us know what happened and why we're here. So I took that ticket, I took the job, I came out here, and I just found a community that I had no idea what it looked like, what they spoke, what they were about. So these Mexicans out in the United States, what do I mean? My, uh, my, my recollection of Latinos in the United States, Mexicans in the United States at that point, had to do a lot with how I spent my summers in the northern part of Mexico, Chihuahua, Coahuila, Reynosa, and so, and Texas, of course, and that was all blurred. We used to go and buy ice cream in El Eagle Pass and then come back to Piedras Negras. And then it was like, there was not a big deal. People would pull in their cars to El Rio Grande, wash them there, and then cross the border and buy more soap and continue doing the same drill. There was not such a big deal about it, right? It quickly changed. So um, my migrant story was absolutely nothing like everybody else's. I did not see those lines. I don't know, I didn't see how hard it was to get here. And I flew straight from Benito Juarez Airport to LAX. Big deal. My migrant story is not fascinating. Neither is it worth talking about it. But when I found these people here that had gone through great lengths to be here, I was like, wait, wait, who are these people? Why don't they tell me about you guys when I'm in Mexico? Right? I had no idea why nobody told us about this diaspora of Mexicans in the United States. So here we are in Mexico. And the next thing I know is Braceros. I remember Braceros. That's not the Bracero. Where did she go? Here. Braceros. Braceros program, right? Do you guys know what a Bracero is? Does everybody know what a Bracero is? So for those of you who don't remember, these people came to the United States. Um, the last program of this kind had two six months period. This man used to come to the United States, work as laborers, and they were supposed to go back to Mexico and live their lives. Well, that did not happen. The old adage is there's nothing more permanent than a temporary worker. And so it was. Hundreds of tens of thousands of them were here. They stayed. 
And then in 19, from 1950 to 1960, during those 10 years, a lot of them stayed here. They had children here. They started families here. And next thing you know is 51% increment in Latino last names. So Hernandez, Gonzalez, Martinez, and the Garcias, they were all here. They were here to stay. They had incorporated. They were part of the whole community. And more importantly, they wanted to blend in. These families not necessarily taught Spanish to their families, to their kids. They, they had this fear of racism that was very real. Mm -hmm. They feared really, really abuses, and they did not want their kids to do this. So they didn't teach them Spanish. Also, they thought, well, maybe I don't teach them Spanish because I wanted to be proficient in English so they do great in school, right? That, those were all thoughts, very real thoughts that lingered with them. And next thing you know, we're in Mexico. We don't know about these families. We come here and guess what? Big surprise. Martinez Hernandez and all these people that I come to meet here, they don't speak Spanish. Well, that was very fascinating to me. So, do you remember La India Maria? <laughs> Does anybody remember what the name of her burrito was? <laughs> no. No. Filemon, se llamaba Filemon, su burrito. Of course, in 1988, La India Maria is a big kid in Mexico. Amazing. She, it, she, she was a writer, producer, director, amazing comedian, and this was her character. Ni de aquí ni de allá. Remember that was a movie. That was a movie, 1988, and this is her favorite sentence. Of mine because it's my story. Todavía no aprendo bien inglés y ya se me está olvidando el español. <laughs> so, right, I'm not here, I'm not there. So all these people aren't necessarily here. They don't know. They speak a little bit of Spanish, a little bit of English. They love our culture, yet it had a little twist to it. So I get here, land, fast forward. This is 1988. Fast forward. I flew in. 2020 and up to, to year 2000. And I find that the most important celebration of Mexicans in the United States is Cinco de Mayo. Oh my God. <laughs> really? Cinco de Mayo? You guys are kidding me. Look, we don't even, it's hardly even thought of in Mexico. Yeah, of course, it had all the celebration, the color, the mariachi, the piñata, the you name it. And it was a very interesting combination between September, September, claro, or Independence Day, and a very bad cliche of Mexico, right? I, how many of you were these small seeds like that? <laughs> <laughs> we don't, right? We don't put that huge, heavy make, uh, makeup on. Of course, it's for theatrical things, but that is not necessarily us. Thank God for David Hayes Bautista. He's, a, he's an amazing guy. He's a, he wrote this book, El Cinco de Mayo, An American Tradition. Everybody knows who David Hayes Bautista is? Yes. Yep. Highly recommended book, of course. This guy is amazing, and I think that he is ashamed, as you were saying, Joanna, he is ashamed of his Spanish. He was saying, he, he used to tell me, well, I have to write in English because I can't, I can't speak Spanish, but I'm Chicano. Muy orgulloso Chicano. Yes, he speaks a little bit of Spanish. Very good. I love his, his. Um, I love his accent, of course. Um, but he did it. Did a great job in this book, explaining to all of us why Cinco de Mayo is so relevant in the United States. It's an American tradition, not a Mexican tradition at all. So we need to understand that to begin with, right? And so um, as as we go along, professor. Um, Professor and director of the Center of Latino Health and Culture at UCLA. I wanted to give him his correct title. That is very important. Dr. Hayes Bautista, this was not his very first, first rodeo. He had before that written another book, or actually a lot of papers, in regards to El 15% de los Estados Unidos. That's how he titled it. Then he wrote a book called La Nueva California. In this book, He's really thorough examining who we are as Latinos, what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are, what our health looks like, what our socials look like, what our understanding of our culture is. Amazing. And that led to a 19-part series that Univision took and made it into 19 little parts. 
that 15% de los Estados Unidos, the 15% of the United States, earned Univision a Peabody Award. The Peabody Award honors the most powerful, enlightening, and invigorating stories in television, radio, online, and, and what else. Here's a little snippet of the moment or the little presentation that they gave at the Peabody Awards. To understand the future, we have to analyze the past. History tells a story, not of one ethnic group, but rather of the key parts that make up the Latino community, its culture. Power cannot be obtained without a fight. Power is won with battles. From pioneers to invaders, from temporary workers to business owners, from being marginalized to being successful. That is the history of the Latino community that in the eyes of many, is still a minority group with its own agenda. But what many do not realize is that this is a community with the same agenda as that of other Americans in search of the same ideals, living and behaving like middle-class Americans. Yes, that was 2005. I think it still applies. This is 2020, 15 years have elapsed. So we were everywhere back then, Washington DC, Congress, uh, in public policy, everywhere, in space. We were in space already at that point in time, right? And we were thriving in 2005. So, question, why don't we see these Latinos? Who are these Latinos? How do they look like, right? That's the main question that brings us here today. Of course, mainstream media was still thinking, we look like El Cinco de Mayo. Big trenzas, big eyelashes, a lot of makeup. Well, of course, I put on a lot of makeup. But that's beside the point. So, but the interesting part is that we forget who these Mexican people are. And excuse me if I keep on saying Mexicans because we're the majority. But I want to include also everybody who is Latino in the United States today. And that is everybody who, oh, we'll get to that later. Let me go back to where I was. <laughs> that was an awful generalization, thinking that we all have this uh, way of, of, of walking around the streets while looking Mexican. It became a thing, right? Driving while Mexican. That's why I pulled him over. Why did you pull him over? Oh, he looks suspect. Yeah, really? Suspect, how suspect? He looked Right? But what is that to begin with? So, of course, you have at this point in time that you have thriving businesses. And again, here we have the Martinez, the Hernandez, the Gonzalez, and the Garcias. <coughs> doing thriving businesses, not speaking Spanish, catering to the Latino community, and moving ahead in life. Fast forward. Here we are. Now it's 2017. Latinos are thriving in the United States, right? So now they're noticing because now we're making money. Now we have businesses now we're really oh oh now we have we know who they are mm -hmm. in 2019 i interviewed mr forbes after he had published this particular article hispanics not trump are the biggest engine of the u.s econo economic growth at that point i asked him mr forbes so what do we what, where do you get this information oh the peterson institute and other other um, investigations right oh okay good and so what is your message to the Latino community? And he said simply like this, he said, the old stereotype of the Latino community has to be discarded with the garbage. He told me on camera, point blank face. And he said, look, there's many things that you guys have to understand. And this is the next article that they published. Four reasons why your 2019 marketing budget should target the Hispanic community. Latinos engage actively with brands online. What does that mean? Well, that means that 80% of adults in the United States of America use their cell phone to buy and to sell. 80%. And they said that they have been using hashtags and discussions about branding online versus 17% of people that were non-Hispanics. That's an important topic. Number two, they are early adopters of technology. Who's familiar with the law of diffusion of innovation? So what it really reads is that you need to reach 15 to 18% of early adopters 
to have good penetration and eventually reach my uh, market success, right? So in order to do that, you need the early adapters. And the, uh, the early adopters of technology are these people who will buy a technological pro technology product from you right away. And that would be 80% Latinos. That's why you need them. Now, they're community focused. We, of course, will like a product and we'll buy it for our tia, la prima, la amiga. We'll, we'll do more of that. We'll be your best representative, right? And then they have buying in their numbers, buying power in their numbers. But what numbers are those? So let me go to this. According to the Pew Research Center, the question of who is Latino, who is Hispanic, and who is not has a lot to do with three little things. Changing labels, shifting categories, and questioning question wording. So here's what we have. Anyone who says he or she is Hispanic is Hispanic. And he or she who says they're not, they're not. Period. That's what the census 2020 said. Isn't that fascinating? It goes something like this. Am I Hispanic? I know you're from to Phoenix, from Mexico. Am I Hispanic? Yes. If you say so, next question. My parents moved to New York from Puerto Rico. Am I Hispanic? Yes, if you say so. My parents went, oh, whoa, whoa. what did I do? I skipped everything, but I'm gonna continue with my sentences. Here we go. My grandparents were born in Spain, but I grew up in California. Am I Hispanic? Yes, if you say you are. And what about I was born in Maryland and married an immigrant from El Salvador? Am I Hispanic? Yes, if you say you are. Last but not least, one of my great grandparents came to the US from Argentina and settled in Texas. That's where I grew up. But I don't consider myself Hispanic. Does the Census Bureau count me as Hispanic? No, if you say you aren't. But yes, if you say you are. Okay. God, isn't that fascinating? So <laughs> after counting all these people who self-claim being Hispanic, 62.1 million self-identified Hispanics in the United States. That makes us 19% of the population. We were 15% in 2005. Power in the numbers, right? That's where we go. So not only that, then um, I'm gonna show you this, this uh, interesting thing from the Stanford Latin Entrepreneurship Initiative 2017, Hispanics in the US. 27% are first generation. Who's first generation? All right, here we go. So now who's 26% and who is second generation? So parents were not born, you were born, uh -huh. no, no. And who is third or more? So see, so every time we're younger, first generation, it's just, it's shifting. We are evolving. That is very fascinating to me. So we go to 2020. The Latino Donor Collaborative has been working really hard in putting all these numbers and studies together for us to be able to share. And we are 68.2% of, we represent 68.2% of growth in the United States in the labor force participation. Those are numbers from 2017, pre-pandemic, of course. That's amazing. Um, and also, uh, whoop, 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 and also, we have a buying power of $2.7 trillion. That's our GDP today. That's an awful big amount of money. Who wants a share of that? Hopefully everyone. So next question is, how do I reach that group? How do I reach that Latino? We still have not uncovered how to get to them, right? We kind of know who they are, but we still don't know how to get to them. That's an avatar. They can explore Pandora and relate immediately to Navis, right? Their greeting was this one. I see you. Not hola, que tal? Not hello, how are you? Nothing, not guten morgen, wie heißt du? I see you. Why is this important to me? And I think it should be important to you. Because we still don't know how Latinos in the United States look. Awesome. Do you see this screen? Mm -hmm. Who here is Latino and who is it? Do you spot the Latinos here? 
All of them. All of them are Mexicans. All of them are Mexican. Yes. We don't need huevo rancheros every day for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Never a mariachi played at my birthday party. <laughs> right? So here's a concept. We, Latinos, Hispanics, we come from different countries. We speak different kinds of Spanish or types of Spanish. Our cultures are very different. I think we meet here. We meet in this area, in this third space with other cultures. I see you. I respect you. I want to meet you. I want to do business with you. I see you. Right? So um, that's called an intercultural space. It's a theory of the third space. Not mine, not yours, but we both have to belong in that space. We both have to feel part of that space. At this point in 2020, every culture is multicultural. We need to understand this. And the contact between two cultures is what makes each culture evolve. There are no better cultures, there are no worse cultures. We are Hispanics in the United States and we are Americans, American mainstream today in the United States. And this is exactly how we look. This is how we look. Every 30 seconds, a young Latino in the United States turn 18. Turns 18, right? What does that mean? So it doesn't matter if it's a political candidacy or if it's a car that you're selling. We need to buy into it. We need to understand that that is part of our brand as well. We are a brand. The goal is to connect with every self-proclaimed Hispanic in the United <laughs> States, right? So if you're a corporation and you need growth, you need to make us buy into your ideal, into your concept, into your belief. And uh, we need to connect with people that believe in what we believe. So how do you reach us? Turn around. Here we are. See us. Respect us. Hire us. That's a very important thing. What do you find us on social media? You find us on TV. You find us on podcasts, on radio, everywhere. In Spanish? Not necessarily. Not all of us speak Spanish. Of course. So, we're bilingual, we're trilingual. How do you make sure that you're reaching us? Stop the stereotypes. See us and hear us. Because by hiring us and training us and making us feel loved, we belong, we buy into your brand, we'll sell your brand, we'll be your spokesperson. We will love it. If you train us, you will let us be. We will speak up, hear us, understand us. You cannot take us for granted. Even if you're Hispanic, I'm not voting for you. If my beliefs are not represented in your candidacy, I don't care if your last name is Martinez or Rodriguez or Garcia. So I would like to share with you a brief video of a new show that I just found to be my favorite. I don't want to move too fast in this one. I, I think I messed up the battery. Here you go. Wow! Oh, stop. Don't play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the Garcias. You know why the Garcias? Mm -hmm. oh, because Gonzalez, Lopez, Martinez, Hernandez, Rodriguez are among the 13 most popular last names in the United States. But Garcias is number sixth. The sixth most popular last name in the United States is Garcia. Oh my God. Here you are. In life, we meet lots of really different characters. None more unique and interesting than the characters that make up what we call our family. Really feeling the feels of mi gente, the people of Mexico. George, you know you're half Puerto Rican. Yeah. While no one is ever quite certain where the path they're on will lead, with the support and love of those around you, it's always more about the journey. Chapulines. The Mexican popcorn, and they're extra spicy. Uh, 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 you know, it doesn't have much. Oh, 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 Yo, that's gonna kick. I'm just trying to save the world that your generation has been so good at destroying. Are you in or out? Oh, that smell of peroxide. 
It's like I'm back in the game. As we say in Mexico, al mal tiempo, buena cara. That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense, but this is who we are. So I love that because it's a brand new show and I think it portrays exactly who we are. So going back to Linda Maria, super talented woman, amazing writer, producer, director, visionary, still valid today. And this is me, and I thank you for seeing me. Thank you so, so much for coming. We're going to have a, an open Q&A session before we end our conference. And wow. It always amazes me when you hear all these and see all these numbers and how present we are and how little we know about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And you know, our mission is to change the narrative. Like how, how we do that if we don't even know about ourselves? So I, I have some questions and then everyone else can uh, jump in as well. Um, first, I'd like to know, as someone who works in the class media, yeah. um, when there is an English commercial, you know, there's big brands out there, and now they're targeting Latinos more than ever. How, what's the process that the commercial has to go through to be shown does it get translated? Does it have to be modified in some ways? How does it work? Mm -hmm. Well, um, that is an easy fix, right? To some people, we're just going to do the same commercial and we're going to do it in Spanish. Well, no. No, mm -hmm. that doesn't work. That doesn't fly. Because, again, you have to be sensitive to what this community is telling you, right? So there's, there's things that go beyond beyond who is who who's latino who's not latino who is i don't know from any other country of the world that we all meet in this Spain, right the most popular commercial and uh, the last super bowl who remembers which one it was ah no chipotle that was the second one chipotle mexican grill it was all music and we all bought into it because guess what it had the essence. We believe in what Chipotle Mexican Grill was saying because guess what? They are true to what they're selling us. And that's what we buy. It. We buy the organic uh, things that they grow. We buy, we buy into them not being for uh, you know mass production of, of anything. And so we all buy into it. It has to do also with our core values. And that is important to note because Dr. Hayes Bautista also speaks about this highly. He says, People think that we are for other interests. The American interests are our interests. <laughs> we are pro-family. We love to work. We are not people that are here to beg for anything, right? So, yes, we are part of the American dream. This is our American dream. And it's completely consistent with the American dream that anybody has a <coughs> nation. So, translating into Spanish is not necessarily the only thing that you have to do. We translate into Spanish to be able to show it in in Spanish language mass media, and that is just because it's a core value of Univision or Telemundo. We, we want to communicate in Spanish, but the heart, the belief, the essence has to be the same. Yep. Um, I'm going to share a quick story from my own experience. So we had about 135 people registered for the conference. Of those, the vast majority was asked what language to prefer said English only or both. Only three people said only Spanish. Which surprises us all the time because we're always having this at the board meetings or the on the women meetings, we're always having this internal questioning of should we do this in Spanish or English in Spanglish? Mm -hmm. What do we do with our language? Because we want to be inclusive but we do not know how. And it's it's, it's, a, it's really interesting that um, we can just translate something. It's not that easy. Yeah. For, for us at, at Univision, it's, a, it's really a mission statement. It's part of the core values of, of Televisa Univision now after they merge, and is to bring media, to bring news in Spanish. That's the idea, or, or media in Spanish. And that's part of the mission, it's part of our niche. So it's like that's what we're targeting. 
but that has nothing to do with excluding anybody else, right? Remember, Spanish is the third most spoken, or one of the three most spoken languages in the world. So if you communicate in Spanish, hugely advantageous. And in the core numbers, English is way down somewhere. So it's like really, Spanish is super valuable, but in this country, we should be at least bilingual, and I know many of us are Spanish. I have another question. Um, so you mentioned stereotypes about Spanish speakers, and I not to be from a media standpoint, this is an age of information, but also Staying true to who you are. I believe in I believe in positive messaging, and I believe that every time you try to fight something negative, you only feel it more. So I, I just completely refrain from from talking, uh, and, and from that's why I did not show anything that says no dogs, no Mexicans. Remember. Yeah. those horrible signs, even if you pick it up just to say this was awful, you're showing it again. My motto is, you know, it's called behavior intervention. You completely extinguish the bad behavior, and that's it. You continue in your lane. You continue doing what you do best. You continue being a positive role model, and that's the best you can do. Mm -hmm. Anyone else like to ask? There's a question in what I'm going to say, so I'm going to try to get to it fast. But I think uh, um, how critical from your experience on being on media, when sometimes you have one shot, right, and you have to get it right, um, I tend to be very flexible with nomenclature, right? But I know it's very convenient. I use it, you know, when, when it fits me. Like in, in my job as a promotor de salud, I kind of train people for them what it means. But we also said in the community, people don't care about your job title, it's about your job description, right? So I'm giving myself a hint. My daughters, I have four daughters, I'm between 11 and 21, and now them and these pronouns, and I'm like, what the heck is going on, right? Like, which one is it? You know, which one are you, you know? And, uh, and I'm like learning about it. Like, I had a strong reaction to the Latinx community. I was like, oh my God, you know? I was like, uh, where do you think it's to our convenience today? We cannot put all of us in the same, but as you said today, if it fits you today, you just go with it. So as a community who's trying to fight for identity and cultural values, we also know that we need to have that fluidity that at some point we should be able to speak as a one voice. So how critical you think is today to pay a lot of attention to nomenclatures without missing the big picture. And 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 you can just react to what I'm saying. I know I didn't place a good question, but I but I but I'm always fascinated by sometimes it is very important to call it as it is. And sometimes the reality is like we are a very confusing bunch and you cannot put us all in the same bucket because we will be the first ones to try to get out of it. How do we go about marketing even ourselves to the whole world? Hispanic and Latin is is absolutely Hispanics, Latinos, it's absolutely interchangeable according to the Pew Research Center, according to the census, and according to just survey done by Univision far out and large. Would you rather be called Latin or would you rather be called Hispanic? They're super interchangeable. Latinx has not been recognized by most. So I would stick to either Hispanic or Latino and use it interchangeably. Um, I tell you, it's like, yeah, I, I actually was, was questioning myself about that as I was writing this and I was thinking about it. So that's how I know precisely how the Pew and the census at least have it like all use it as you as you want and as you may. So yeah, of course, there's a lot of hard lines. I'm not Hispanics, tiene que ver con España y Latinos, con Latinoamérica. But yeah, we can be uh, as puristas como queramos. Ah, no. Yo no soy de acá ni de allá. No, I, I really feel that you can use them interchangeably and nobody should be feeling insulted. I want to say thank you so much for um, speaking on this topic. And that's actually how I found out about this conference because I um, I asked, I was in a webinar on Facebook and I asked uh, Gilberto, I was like, 
uh, for the marketing purposes, Hispanic or Latino. And he's like, whatever, you know, you wish. And then we email each other and he's like, I'll be at this conference. But this is exactly one of the topics that I feel like growing up, um, you know, I was, vengo de Zacatecas, where are my Zacatecanos here? <laughs> Desde chiquita, yo, I was like so white, like green eyes, you know, and even my mom's like, no, cuando el coyote las agarró ustedes, like, he uh, te agarró a ti, dijo, no, denme la güerita porque con ella no me llevan, like, they're not, nobody's going to ask anything, right? <laughs> so I grew up my whole life just feeling like I didn't belong, you know, like, de quien eres, del lechero, del cartero, y esta, <laughs> y esta güerita, de donde se la robaron, you know? And it's funny because I worked for a hospital for 14 years as a medical interpreter. I just left my job last year. But even then, like, I never felt like I was Mexican enough, you know? And so as a youth growing up in the United States, when you're too white to be Mexican and too Mexican to be white, to be white you don't find a place to belong. So just being in this group where I feel like, I'm like, okay, I like, you know, arriba Zacatecas, you know? <laughs> you know? Pero una cosa que, um, especially in the, in the work that I'm doing with suicide prevention, it's like, I'm a pioneer just to begin with, right? Pero me ha tocado este, como organizaciones que they're like, I want you to come and be the spokesperson. And I do all these like events. I've even done some with Univision. And then they cut these big organizations a check. Y yo me quedo como, and everybody's like, you te pagaron a ti? You know, like, y what did you get out of it? Or, you know, my mom, she thinks, she's like, no, tú no más andas ahí to, todo el tiempo gratis, right? And y eso es como uno se queda, like, how do you, how do we own that back? Mm -hmm. And even just the other day, um, we, we were like, do we name the network just Suicide Prevention Network or Hispanic? And, and then one of the guys is like, from AFSP, they're like, um, we want you to be the spokesperson. And I mean, you can only talk about AFSP, but people will find out about what you do. O sea, como siempre, like, nosotros siendo la cara, like, siendo el frente, because there's a big market, right? How do we take that back? How do I, like, market myself or even say, hey, like, this is how much I'm worth. Like, pay me for, for being that brand, you know? Like, we keep saying, you know, you got to be the leader and you got to be your brand. But how do you brand yourself? Especially when you're, you got this big organization that you're looking at, like, do I want the exposure? But at the same time, why should they get the money if we're, you know, bringing in all this, what we are calling, um, you know, economic growth? Well, that, that is a huge question. And that is what everybody asks themselves. Even at Univision, they say, like, why would any minute at Univision be less costly for an advertiser? When we have this many personalized delivering that pay the same for toilet paper and toothpaste, we don't get a, a we don't pay less for it because who we are, or we don't pay more for it, right? At the same time. So the first thing is, do you know the power of the word no? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Of course. There you go. So we need to make sure that we drill that into our minds. Because I tell you, I have a lot of friends who are like, no, I'm not going. What I'm not going. And when you get the opportunity to go, you show them what you can do. And again, the other thing is a lot of a lot of people that I know with it, what they have done is to climb up the ladder as a uh, employee. And then when once they have made them a name for themselves, that's when they start going, No, I'm not going unless you pay me. I'm not going unless you pay me this much. So yeah, and the, and again, partner up. Partner up with somebody who's doing the same thing that you're doing is already there. And that's again the power of uh, in the in the numbers in the fours in being together. That's what I would suggest. To you. But, yeah. Good and, and actually, uh, congratulations for what being the cool Thank you. Great question. Uh, follow up to that. So I'm from New York. Where left? I don't know if there's any poblanos here. <laughs> um, but to that, right? I think that's a power struggle for, for me, for instance. For the past 10, 15 years that I've been in, in my career in sales, to go try to partner up with someone that has the same vision. For me, growing up, it has been more of like, if I do that, I'm just trying to grab onto their success and trying to make it my own, right? How do I change that mindset? Because that, this is partly the reason why I came over, because I'm like, listen, I think everyone here thinks alike, and we can all help each other, right? I think something that I've realized in, in, within my own community is that we like to keep the information to ourselves and not necessarily help out to each other. So for me, it's just like, I don't want to sell you anything. I just want to be helpful to you. As, as in the same, you know, una mano lava la otra. Let's put it that way, right? And sometimes I don't see that where other communities where, that I have exposure to, 
de, se rescatan. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I was sharing earlier today, um, I was at a conference one day. It was not a conference. They were opening up a branch, a bank branch, and there was, Henry Cisneros was there. I mean, a lot of very important people were there. And one said, this is crazy. Everybody listen to this because I don't really heard it before. I don't think we have. When a dollar lands in the hand of a person in the Jewish community, that dollar changes from Jewish hands to Jewish hands to Jewish hands. Yes. Mm. Six and thank you for saying that because for Latinos, what? Mm -hmm. yep. there's a book about it so please I mean come on we have to hire each other and again and it's not only us we are not selling only to Latinos are we no we want the world right. to know about what we're doing but again if we don't try to support each other as much as we can they were earlier talking about the chambers it's so important to belong in a group that is going to make you stronger. And that's why I'm here today. That's why I flew from the other coast too. Because I really think that we need to make sure that we support each other. We need to do it because it's crazy. I mean, look at the African-Americans. It doesn't matter if this is crazy. You're in a boardroom. And I'm sure I'm speaking to the choir because you guys have been in boardrooms. And you're sitting there and there's all white people and brown people and purple and black and blue. And then all of a sudden that African-American says something outrageous and everybody goes, whoa. Well, the African-American over here, no matter what, is going to support him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No matter what. Was that even in the room? Oh, whatever he said goes, oh, whoa, whoa, what happened? <laughs> so where is that support from each other? I don't know, so close. It's insane. We need to do it. We have to. Can I just add a brief comment to that? I was talking to some of the board members about my uh, a special predilection to the Jewish culture precisely because of what you said. It's been proven. I mean, they are always helping each other out. I just got hired by a Jewish uh, partner at a law firm, and I said yes. Why? Because he's not only because he's Jewish, but because I know that the solidarity that he shows to his people speaks volumes to me. And so what I've sought to do to replicate that, not just admire it in him, because we need to act upon it, is every time I go to a Mexican restaurant in New Orleans or anywhere, I make sure that the owner is Mexican or at least minimum Hispanic. If not, I'm not dining there. I'm not having lunch there. Why? Because it's my self-imposed uh, teaching myself to help Mexican people grow their businesses. To me personally, while I very, uh, my family is very multicultural, we have Muslims in our family, Colombians, Spaniards, Argentinians, Mexicans, obviously we're the base, I call it the base color. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but, but I'm not hating on other cultures, but what I'm trying to tell you is, uh, what I'm trying to tell you is like, I always watch out for it. Now, I always watch out for who are my Mexicans because when I go to some supermarkets, they're being owned by people out there in Europe or Middle East. I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why? And the people that are taking the cash, the cashiers, the, the at the places, they're Hispanics. Yes, cheap labor. But why why do we do that to ourselves? We're just self-inflicting ourselves wounds. Yeah, and, and you know, it's interesting. I went, we went last night to a restaurant, and it's a Mexican restaurant. My first question was, and how many Latinos are working here? I want to know the entire composition that looked like. Not only the owner, and not only the people in the kitchen. I want to know everybody, right? And yeah, 90% of the people were Hispanics or Mexican. So I think that's very valuable. Oh, I have a quick question. I think something that I come across in my own family is that, especially with my parents or grandparents, is that there's some reluctancy to change, like similar to the story about pronouns. It's like, why is this happening? Why is this change happening? Or, you know, I was born in a different time. Like, this is how I was raised, so I can understand that. So I guess I just have some advice on, like, how to communicate. You know, things are evolving socially, environmentally, and sometimes it's really hard to communicate that to my family members who maybe have not pursued education before and are getting this like immense information of like this is how society is structured and the structural challenges in that and like they don't have that context they have experiences but not like the context and so sometimes i have a hard time like i feel like this is the first time i've been in a room with people like of older generations not saying that <laughs> but and it's so nice to see that but i feel like in my own experiences like my family's not there so how do you communicate 
like change in a positive way to people who are not in the spaces that, that I occupy. Can you imagine how hard they have it in other cultures? Mm -hmm. We're not nearly as, as conservative and tight as others. I can only imagine how hard other people have it. But the reality is that you will not do it. It doesn't depend upon you. You cannot do a thing. There's a very interesting joke about this. Do uh, you know how many presidents of Mexico do you need to change a light bulb? <laughs> and you need one that brings a ladder, another one that climbs it, another president that brings a light bulb, another one that turns it around, and so on. Do you know how many psychologists do you need to change a light bulb? None. It only takes the light bulb to want to change. <laughs> so if the light bulb doesn't want to change, it's not going to change. So the reality is that you know you need to you need to do what again, stay on your lane. You do what you need to do. You, you, you show them. Like, well, we're talking about cryptocurrency here. Can you believe it? It's not, gonna, it's not gonna get into them until they feel. So it's interesting. I was talking about the early adopters, right? So there's like three stages. There's, first of all, the, your founders, right? Your innovators, that little group of people. Then you have your early adopters. Then you have another group of people who are your mainstream. And then you have the slaggers. The last one group, only by cell phones, because rotary phones are not available anymore. They're not going to do it. So don't waste your time. You stay in lane, you get your things done, and once they see you thriving, they're like, well, what did she do? Oh, let me join her on this. That's my recommendation. Just, uh, just more of a comment and maybe a question, but um, I think we do our, our community a disservice when we don't know our history. You know, when I was when I was listening to the presentation, the wonderful presentation, and thank you. And Univision is a Univision is the president here, and Univision is on my board of directors of an organization that I have. So I'm very, um, you know, very proud of Univision what they do here in Chicago. But one of the things is, as I was listening to you talk, I'm thinking about you know my grandparents, and, and uh, so. There was a gentleman by the name of Felipe Castaneda who started a Mexican orchestra in South Chicago in 1927. That was my, my grandfather. But he was born in a town in Texas that his mother was born in. When she was born in that town, it was Mexico. So, you know, and one of the things that, I, you know, that, that defines us by others is we're all immigrants. You know, I'm like five generations, but I'm an immigrant because we've allowed others, one, to tell our story, two, we don't, we don't, we don't know our history. And it's what's really interesting is if you, I'm kind of a movie buff, if you go back to the 40s, they had a lot of Mexicanos in the movies, especially in Westerns. And then if you think of the 50s, you had things like Cisco Kid and Zorro. Our young people had heroes, right? And I shared this story with you because the, I worked for McDonald's Corporation. I was vice president of diversity. And we, I was just sharing with Sydney that we bought you four when I was there. And he, we did some story and it was a thing about Hispanic heroes. And he said, Ray, he said, you know, it must be nice for you that there's Latino heroes now. I go, what do you mean? He says, well, there were no Hispanic heroes when you were growing up. And I said, well, first my parents and then my grandparents. Mm -hmm. But I said, you know, we had the Cisco King, Zorro, and we had people like Roberto Clemente, and Al Lopez, which none of you would know who he is, but he was a, he was a manager for the Chicago White Sox in the 1950s. But we don't know our history. Mm -hmm. And we're doing ourselves, our young people, a disservice. You go into the schools and the kids hang their heads because they don't know the contributions that we made. We built the stockyard, we built the railroad. We did so many phenomenal things, just like the Chinese and just like all the other groups. But guess what? The other groups all tell their stories in the movies, right? The Jews, the Jewish people tell their stories. Black people are now starting to tell their stories. Where's our stories? Where's our histories? You know, and if, if anything, I, any message to the media or pe people who, who are, are talented and writers, start talking to your parents and your grandparents and get our stories. 
starting to write those books, it's, you know, really, we can go all the way back to Christopher Columbus. He was stolen by the Italians. His name is Cristobal you know, Cristobal Colon. His name's not Christopher Columbus. There was no Christopher Columbus in 1492, was there? Where did that name come from? Who created that name? And then, and then the whole Latino piece was just left out of it, right? I was just sharing, you know, when you, when, when the white, just ask yourself this, but here's my question. When the white settlers crossed the Mississippi, when they were going to settle the West, who do, you know, who do they read, who do they see when they got to the West? What people do they see? The Indians, right? Who else? The Mexicanos. The Mexicanos, but what were they? What were they called? The Indians. Oh, what were they? They were? Indians. Cowboys, right? Caballeros, right? The, the cowboys, right? They had the rodeos. Rodeo is not American. It was Mexican, right? What happened to us? You know, a friend of mine did a book on that, and almost everything on the horse and the cowboy is all Spanish. But they, you know, and it's the American, cowboys are the American icon throughout the world, and they were Mexicans. <laughs> right? So I recommend that you read uh, La Nueva California. You won't believe it. The, the research that Dr. Hayes Bautista does is unbelievable. Yeah. And I have a better one for you that you have to use. The deeper your roots, the higher your branches will always break. So you have to get your roots down, like the trees. That's important. Very, very, very important. Thank you. Yeah, but again, we have to tell us positive stories yeah. to know our history. And it starts with your parents and your grandparents. So you will find some phenomenal stories and when they came and how they got here and what they went through and the difficult times that they I, I did I did a story a long time ago for um for Univision called um Las eh, Audaces Mujeres del Oeste. Because they were not in the books. If you look at the books, the training posts and everything, it reads 250 soldiers and two women. Yeah, no. <laughs> right? And three kids. The reality was that they never counted the women because they were Kongba, they were Shumash, they were all the, all the different uh, people in the, in, the, in the communities there at that point. Yeah, there muchísimas mujeres, solo una, only one of them appears uh, later on in the books. Her name is Toy Purina. It was the only woman, woman of, of, of indigenous um, history who actually faced off with the soldiers there at some point in time. And then she was killed, but she was the only one who really put a rebel group against the, the, the people there, against the Spaniards. That was the only reason why she made it through. I'll give you a better one. All, all, the women, <laughs> all the women in the Alamo, all the women in the Alamo, and there was a lot of them, were what? Mexicanas. Mexicanas. You never hear about that. In Zacatecas. <laughs> oh, they didn't make a movie about the women of the Alamo, what they did. Yes, women of the Alamo. That's a great story. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the questions, I think it's like an open call for people working in the media as, as you. Uh, I think uh, one of the challenges for the community uh, is that we are still underrepresented in some professional activities. Like in my case, I work in science and technology. There are people working there, but we don't see them too much. It's very difficult to do like a good working because there is no visibility on the things that we work about. So I, it's, it's really like a you know a call for for you guys to help us to you know to promote not only all science and technology but in general. I'm sure that are, uh, as I say, activities where we are still underrepresented. So if anything we can get from media more attention, more promotion of things that are done for people in all the countries from Mexico, which we I think that's super. Important. And so, so this is my question to you because this, we go back to the same thing. How do you identify Latino? If I see you, and I see you in a group of, uh, let's say over there, in this other area of the same place, right? In uh, one of these, uh, uh, I don't know, those places, right? And I see you there. How do I know you're Latino? Unless you let me know you're Latino. Unless you say, hola. Unless you say, I don't know, you know what? Let's go to this Mexican restaurant. Ah, porque aquí me gusta comer eso. I don't know. There's some clues that I need to get from you to know that you're Latino. 
so I can connect with you. For us in the media, sometimes it's really hard to identify who's Latino and who isn't. I did not know that Wade Crawford, the, the um, uh, natural resources uh, secretary in California, speaks fluent Spanish. I had no idea. I interviewed him in English, and then he's like, ah, por si acaso hablo español. I'm like, oh, okay. You can start all over again, right? Things like that. You've got to let us know. You've got to make yourself visible. No, I'm, I'm sure that there are things like, for instance, the previous uh, uh, presentator about the podcast. That's a beautiful, I mean, that's a great idea. But also there is a part that you guys from the media, uh, you can also help us to, you know, to, to just to get more attention and more visibility. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's important also for the community to grow up in terms of, yeah, science no, and technology. Like, it, it, the more it, we promote, more people, more kids will, okay, exactly. I want to do that, you know, and, so. And then we need to help each other out in that sense, because I tell you what, to us in the media, it's always very hard to find experts in the field that speak Spanish. Yeah. Because we need to be there are many. Yes, I know. Because, for example, I need to speak to somebody in the Metropolitan Water District. This is the agency that manages the water of the Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles, and then some. Can you believe that they couldn't get me one person that spoke Spanish? So they got me one, and I said, okay. The señor Cetina, fantástico. Luis Cetina, boom, 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 done. Okay, so now I want to deal with this other topic. Oh, no. That's not Luis's topic. Huh? What do you mean? Then okay, then give me the expert. It's bad. No, we don't have anybody. I had to go back to one of the one of the five people that in the in that in that um, in the metropolitan water district and tell them, for crying out loud, you guys need more than one person. You you manage all the energy and all the water in the Los Angeles County. Can't be right. So maybe we have the people out there, but they're not. It's all about access too, right? Maybe they don't have access to those particular places where they're going to be paid more, where they're going to have more representation, and they're going to actually do something about our community, right? So we need to push a little harder. We need to bring in the people that we know are in the same path, and we need to make each other stronger. And I'll second that. Um, so, you know, most of you guys are, are from mostly Central or West, West Coast based. In New York City, for instance, right, where I come from. There's not there's not many edu Mexican educated um, individuals, right? Low percentage in high school graduation rates and college time and graduation rates. So when I meet, for instance, I'm the only Latino in sales, for instance, right now. The youngest too, by the way. My the one that hired me, he's Caucasian, right? He's like, hey, I, I need someone here to speak Spanish as well, because obviously he's trying to meet, you know, HR compliance, right? But what I tend to do is just go to family members go to schools, have engagements, and show them, hey, you can go into IT if you're interested. If you're interested in making additional resources? This is another venue, right? But what I see sometimes is two things. Family, because they don't know or they don't know how to access that. Second, the individual. They don't have representation. So one thing that I've always learned in my very short um, career, closed mouths don't get fed. In other words, if you don't ask, you, you won't get it. Second thing, your network is your net worth. I'm learning that now. Before I was here to do that, right? And that, to your point with the water administration, they need that, right? Now they can put initiatives to that. My company, for instance, I'm pushing for that. Like, we need to get more Latin speaking individuals here because if you, if we're starting, we're starting to get clients where they're asking, hey, how diverse is your workforce? Because now we have to push back against um, opportunities, right? In sales. So one thing I'm trying to do all the time, and this is the reason why I'm here as well, is network and connect the dots. Help the next round of, of, of individuals who have a passion in IT, or in science, in technology, whatever it is, you can do it. You want to go into media? Guess what? We have individuals. We have programs for it. Because if you were to ask me, hey, Robert, why are you at where you're at? It's not because of a Latino necessarily. It was because it was a, a, a white person um, program, and I took advantage of it. And that's something that I would like to have changed. So that, that way we go out there and have positive reinforcement, have positive engagement, and that way we can be more in the yeah. in the fields that we need to be representing. Yeah. 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 Yeah
great. I mean, 100%. Yeah. I was like, that's no, you finish. Sorry. No, you are. No, yes, to, to your point, um, Robert. Um, I think I shared with all of you in 2020, I was honored to be um, listed on the one top 100 in finance, which granted is a fail, uh, male dominated industry. So from 20 uh, guys, there were only 23 women. And from those 23 women, um, one Latina you're looking at her right now. So I was in shock, obviously, when I saw the magazine. But I, I took one step forward just talking to the magazine. They said, probably you think I'm the only one, but no. So we need to become our best. I, I talk about the mentor, just like yourself, mentor, coach, and sponsor. I'm a sponsor in another woman. So you know that we have more people that in, in IT, in finance, in any industry, I think we have that responsibility, moral responsibility to let them know that it's not only me. We have a bunch behind us or next to us and to help each other. At, at, at the end of the um, uh, day, it, it's that. Become the best promoter of the person next to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. On that note, I'd like to ask one last question. Uh -huh. So based on the very diverse group that we have in front of us, all the faces that you showed us, what is the single word you think that unites Latin America in the US? Warrior. I would say we're all guerreros. I think that everybody that is Latin in the United States is fighting, and we need to just unify our fight. That's what we need to do.